Hi and Namaste. My name is Henry Shadikaya. I'm a French Canadian hypnotherapist, psychotherapist that has worked with more than 10,000 clients. And my special field of interest is brainwashing and mind control by cults. Over the last few months, I have made more than 12 videos on the presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard and you can find all of those videos listed under this video. Today I would like to focus our attention on the guru of Tulsi Gabbard. His name is Chris Butler. So this is the story of Chris Butler in a nutshell. He was born in 1947 in New Orleans and he was raised in Hawaii mostly on the island of Molokai. When he was a teenager he got deeply involved in drugs including LSD and by the time he was 20 year old. He had a following of dozens of disciples because he was claiming that he had spiritual realization. Here's a picture of him around that time. Around 1970 he discovered the Hare Krishna movement and decided to join the Hare Krishna movement with all of his followers that numbered about 50 people. And here's the pictures of him with Swami Bhaktivedanta. He stayed for a while but then he decided by the time Swami Bhaktivedanta passed on in 1977 he organized his own cult called the Science of Identity and then added different title to his name which was Siddhar Swarup. He added Jagat Guru Siddhar Swarup Ananda Paramahamsa which means I am the greatest spiritual master in the universe. He accepted disciples and then he sent his disciple around the world to increase the number of followers, be in the Philippines, in Poland, Australia and so on. So the story that I'm presenting today is a testimonial of one of his ex-follower. His name is Jan Koviak. I have been reading the testimonial of Jan Koviak on culteducation.com now for many years and I thought this young man is very intelligent and although he's been through a lot in his young life he has made of himself a successful man and a successful family man. I have a lot of respect for this young man. So I communicated with him and I did ask him to give me a Skype interview that you will see in this presentation. There's a lot of lesson to learn from the testimonial of Jan Kovjak. Jan and his mother were introduced to the Butler cult in New York. He was only 10 years old and it only took a couple months for his mother to be completely brainwashed in thinking that Chris Butler was the pure representative of God on earth. The cult basically took over their apartment they put pictures of Chris Butler all over the wall of the apartment and used the apartment as a preaching center where they would give presentations on Sunday 
where they would show videos of Chris Butler, where they would distribute the books of Chris Butler. And it only took a couple of months before they were convinced to move to Los Angeles to serve Chris Butler full time. And as you will hear from Jan, two months after meeting the cult, they would already see the world black and white. He was told by his mother, do you want to come with me in Los Angeles or do you want to stay with your demonic father? Do you want to come with me or do you want to stay with your materialistic friends. That's the basic teaching of the butler cult. There's devotees and there's demons. If you are with butler, you are a devotee. If you are against him, you're a demon. It is a very sad story in many ways. After being a year in Los Angeles, butler told the mother of Jan that she should go to Poland and open a preaching center for the Polish people to tell them the good news that Chris Butler was the pure representative of God on earth. And then Jan was sent to the Philippines in the school of Butler for four long years where he suffered physical, emotional, and mental abuse. There's a lot to learn about cult brainwashing by listening to the testimonial of Jan Kowiak. Please listen attentively. This nice young man, Jan Kowiak. Thank you, Jan for this interview. I would like to know how was your introduction to the Butler cult with your mother in New York? So we were introduced by uh, Polish devotees of Butler um, who his name was Vishnu Das and Tapasya Das and they introduced us um, to Butler's books like Reincarnation Explained and uh, and uh, you know, science of identity videos that he had, and so forth. So it was kind of a uh, kind of a mantra meditation slash yoga meditation kind of an introduction, and um, it was about a month or so into knowing them that we had been persuaded to offer our apartment for regular, um, like as a preaching center for people to come on Sundays and watch videos of butlers and do some chanting of mantras and things like that. Your mother at this time was vulnerable? Yeah, definitely. She had lost a friend to suicide and another of one of her good friends was had developed uh, lupus and um, she was just struggling a lot as a, you know, single mother and, um, you know, taking care of me and, uh, trying to basically find uh, find a balance in her life. You were how old then? I was 10 years old. How long did it take for your mother to become uh, like a staunch devotee of Butler? Um, it was very fast. I'd say probably about, you know, two months was the period between, you know, kind of hearing some initial ideas, becoming vegetarian, and then offering our house pretty much full, full scale to having pictures of Butler all around the house and, um, you know, praying regularly to him and chanting on beads and listening to his lectures and reading some uh, basic scriptures like Bhagavad Gita. So you were told at that time that Butler was what or was who? Well, Butler to, you know, to us was God's representative on earth and uh, it was, you know, by surrendering and giving our uh, service, time, energy, money and uh, love and surrender and focus uh, to Butler that, that we were, you know, somehow connecting ourselves with, with, with this new God that we are introduced to, uh, Krishna and uh, his girlfriend Radha and uh, and the whole cast of 
mythological characters of uh, you know pretty much the Vedic pantheon. Were you told that he was the only pure representative of Krishna on earth? Yes, and we were also told that he was in a long line of spiritual teachers and uh, going through to, to Swami Bhaktivedanta, who was his predecessor in, in the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, and, um, and that he was his successor. next in line of success, succession, but not appointed, but just that he was, uh, you know, rightfully a, a you know, representative of this particular long spiritual lineage going all the way back to, you know, the sun god and the creator of the universe and all these things. So about a year after we had met those devotees and, you know, given our house over to preaching and whatnot, um, it was just made very apparent that in order to continue a proper spiritual life, we needed to be, uh, you know, close to Chris Butler. And uh, we were convinced to go and move there to Los Angeles, where he lived at the time in Malibu. And um, we... My mother gave me a choice to either stay with my, you know, at this point we had developed, you know, this understanding that my father was a demon and my uh, friends were materialists and carnies and, and uh, you know, basically a detriment to any kind of spiritual progress. And so she gave me a choice as if I wanted to go with her and stay in this horrible demoniac world. And, you know, as a young boy, I had already had some you know, time uh, exploring this philosophy and the mythology and stuff. And I, you know, I didn't want to be away from my mom. And so I went with her and, um, and we went and stayed with some uh, devotees for a few months there in Malibu and uh, got heavily involved in the um, uh, devotee scene over there with, um, you know, different service opportunities and uh, kirtans and things like that. So what was the service of your mother and were you involved in serving in any way in Malibu and where was he living in Malibu? So Chris Butler had a beachfront home in Malibu at the time. He was already married to Wailana and um, you know there was um, in terms of service, you know, it ranged from, uh, you know, simple things like, you know, picking up flowers and, you know, picking up, you know, laundry or food items or things like that. Um, other times it was, you know, ca ca carrying heavy, you know, equipment to the beach for, for recording Butler's lectures. Um, it just ranged. I mean, it was all sorts of stuff. Butler already had a group of personal servants you know that were kind of tending to his needs daily needs and um yeah so that was the extent of you know our sort of service and then you know mostly we were going to the sunday gatherings on the beach and butler would walk down the beach and you know do some kirtan and throw some you know flowers and uh sweets and stuff to the audience and um and then give a lecture and then he would walk home and uh you know there's a lot of things surrounding all those events but that was the that was basically what 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 took place how many months after you arrived in los angeles was it decided that your mother is going to go to poland to open a center for him and you were going to be going to the Philippine in Butler School? Um, we were there for about a year, and um, after about a year, it was a few, I noticed that a few boys from the community were leaving and not around anymore, and when we inquired where they were going, you know, we were told that they were doing a very serious service and going to uh, let their parents engage full-time and in Butler's service by going to Gurukula, which is a very important, you know, place where they're going to educate them and, and become more versed in the scriptures and become expert in serving Krishna and Butler. And, um, and so, uh, you know, some letter, we were advised to write some letters of, you know, have, get some old devotees to write some letters of recommendation about my character and about a month into, uh, 
all of that, we ended up, uh, I, I went, was sent to a boys' school in Oxnard, California for about a month. It was kind of a preparatory school to get us used to waking up at four in the morning and taking cold showers and doing all the austerities that would um, be happening in the Philippine school. And then you were sent to the Philippines. And after that, I was sent to the Philippines. Um, I arrived there and... Um, it was not too long before Mount Pinatubo had exploded, so there was a lot of ash that was covering everything, and um, we made our way up to Baguio, where the school was. And, um, <clears throat> you know, for the first month or two, I was pretty homesick, and I didn't know if I was going to be able to stay. Um, but there's, you know, kind of an overwhelming feeling of, you know, doing your duty as a brahmachari and also just feeling like I would be displeasing to Butler if I had left. And, um, you know, the devotees were urging me to sort of uh, keep at it and, and um, you know, that in time, if I have faith in Butler and Krishna, then I will, you know, I will feel better and that kind of thing. Now, Butler was living a, a luxury life in Malibu, while you boys in that school were having a very austere type of life. Could you describe the austerity that you went through there? Our day started at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we would wake up. And um, we are all uh, separated in various rooms, mostly uh, by age. And um, we would have one boy who was sort of in charge of our room. We would take cold bucket showers and be in the temple room by, by 4.30, 5 o'clock. And um, we would chant for an hour on our beads in the dark temple room. And, um, you know, boys would be falling asleep naturally, especially some of the younger boys. The boys range in age from uh, about 10 to their early 20s. And, um, and, uh, and we chanted, then we had Artik ceremony, more kind of congregational chanting, kirtan. And then we had uh, a lecture would either be given by the headmaster, but mostly it was uh, just lecture audio tapes or... Um, transcriptions that were read of Butler's lectures and then we would write an essay uh, on those lectures and then uh, move on to our other activities. So there was not a much of an education with uh, normal school learning? Um, not excessive, it was, you know, we had mathematics and uh, we had um, grammar and, you know, spelling, vocabulary, language arts, that kind of thing. Um, but all of it was woven and tied in with uh, either something to do with Butler's service or Krishna's service or mythology in the Vedas. And, um, you know, there was definitely no rigorous, you know, science on, you know, the sun god pulling a chariot with the sun around the planets and, um, you know, this kind of more archaic Vedic uh, ar uh, astronomy. And... Um, who were you taught that Butler was in that school? Well, if you ever see photographs from the school, you know, it's Butler's picture is just as big as Krishna and Chaitanya's picture on the altar. And, um, you know, he was, he was explained to us to be our only connection to a spiritual life and to God. And that basically he was, you know, for all inten intents and purposes, he was God on earth. And he's had many lectures stating that the spiritual master is to be worshipped like Krishna. And, uh, you know, that if you take care of your spiritual master, you're taking care of your spiritual life. And by serving your guru, you're serving Krishna. For, for us, he was God. And um, obviously any, any kind of doubt or displeasure or... Um, you know, that you didn't like something he was saying or if he questioned something. I mean, it was just out of, out of the question. You didn't, do, you didn't have doubts and you didn't question anything because this immediately equaled, you know, damnation and uh, suffering and um, repeated birth and death and all that stuff. So what's your worst memory about being in that school? <laughs> Um, you know, there was sexual abuse from the other boys. Um, you know, Butler had a very um, strong preaching against homosexuality. He had 
obviously, as brahmacharis, we had very strong uh, preaching towards, uh, you know, any kind of anti-sexual, anti-family, anti-woman message was, you know, was heavily preached. Um, you know, and it was not uncommon for, you know, for all of us to, you know, kind of just go to sleep at night and, you know, you would hear people either masturbating or crying, you know, and, um, it was, uh, that's, that's what I remember. I remember basically a lot of boys who were psychologically damaged. There was no counselors. There was nobody to, you know, have a sane and rational discussion about what was going on at the school. Um, you know, it was actually very isolating and, you know, even though we are surrounded by friends and you would think, oh, it's, you know, because of our lack of ability to have contact with our parents and kind of a normal, uh, day-to-day dynamic with, with adults, you know, we were basically just always facing our own, you know, demons and fears just as, as, you know, young boys together without, you know, really any adult intervention besides heavy mythology and heavy preaching against the very things we were probably struggling with psychologically. So those were, you know, there's, there's definitely other things. And, you know, we, we were disciplined heavily for different things, you know, being late to Taekwondo class, we would have to do a hundred knuckle push-ups and things like that. Um, You know, it was run like a military we slept on bunk beds. If our bunk beds were not made, we had some kind of penalty to pay for that. We had to write an extra essay or, you know, do some kind of other, um, you know, kind of a payback for, for not doing that. Were you sexually abused there? I was, yeah. I was abused, you know, uh, you know, kind of in a, in a way by a fellow student. So it was, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I, I pretended that I was sleeping, but in essence, you know, I was being groped and, and uh, touched by a fellow student. And, um, you know, I don't know how much of this stuff happened with other students, but I do know that there was many boys who were definitely psychologically damaged and exhibited weird behavior. You know, one boy cut off all of his toenail and fingernail nails and uh, was bleeding excessively. Um, and there's a lot of other things, a lot of boys who were just... Um, just just had awkward and odd behavior patterns and stuff that was just never tended to other than to saying that it was their false ego, their karma, or that they were somehow being displeasing to Krishna and so they were suffering in some way. Um, this was kind of the day-to-day explanation for any number of mishaps was just that, oh, you're, 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 in, you're believing in your false ego, you have self-pity, your car, your karma, you're displeasing in some way to Krishna or to Butler, all sorts of things like that. Just kind of, you know, irrational ways of dealing with people's minds and energy and time. Could you tell us about the events or the few events where you and the other student were shown pornographic movies of homosexual having sex? in uh, gay parades and things yeah i mean they were they were not classic you know pornographic films but they were you know it was footage of gay parades in san francisco and the footage came from mike gabbard or krishna Kathadas, and um it was for their campaign called stop promoting homosexuality hawaii and they featured you know various gay parades with men who were engaging in uh, anal sex intercourse. And, um, you know, at the end of the footage, you know, there's men who are dying in a hospital of AIDS and uh, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, it was uh, definitely a very shaky and traumatic kind of thing to see at, you know, at our age, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, you know, and uh, mostly our times as far as listening to Butler lectures, that's when we were exposed to majority of the kind of, you know, heavy descriptions. Butler would describe all sorts of fringe homosexual acts, you know, people pissing or shitting on each other and weird stuff like that. And um, he would describe that in videos in uh, in recorded lectures. Yeah. yeah. And um, and then we would have to write lectures about it, you know, saying that homosexual homosexual are like, you know, they're lower than animals, they're maggots, you know, and Butler would use words like faggots and 
you know, dykes and, you know, queers and this and that, you know, to basically, you know, demonize this group of people, obviously highlighting very specific, you know, sex practices and stuff. And, um, you know, I don't know how many lectures I listened to like that, where it's just, um, he would just go on rants. He would just get very angry and just go off and on about describing all of these sex acts, asking the devotees what they thought, and everyone would laugh. And, um, you know, he was kind of, it was a back and forth sort of getting a kick out of the devotees and basically gay bashing is what I can describe it, you know. And, you know, that kind of bullying mentality was kind of prevalent throughout the whole group, you know, your your relatives who weren't in the group were demons or materialists or karmis or mayavadis, you know, and everybody else was wrong and we were right. And, you know, even even within the small Gaudiya Vaishnava groups like ISKCON and other groups, you know, Butler was the, you know, was the one and then all the other ones were false and not to be trusted and followed and um, we even saw sometimes devotees on the street and we were asked immediately to turn around and not engage with them or say Hari Bol or um, Namaste or, you know, anything. And um, it was just very isolating. A lot of a lot of just anger and frustration and hatred towards other people and, and at the same time to love and affection and, you know, gratitude and, you know, meditation and all this stuff. And then, you know, it was, it was this, it was a weird, uh, weird kind of a mental shift that, that, you know, we were all going through. So it's on, on a daily basis. So this uh, anti-homosexual things you've heard it dozens of time, a hundred time, and it was for him sort of, sort of a aversion therapy said that you would never become most homosexual but still there was some homosexual activities in your school since kids did touch each yeah. other and stuff yeah and the lectures weren't the lectures weren't um you know they weren't specifically for us brahmacharis i mean the lectures were sent to us from lectures he was giving to his you know adult disciples back back in california or new zealand or australia or wherever he was and um you know i don't know why he got on such an anti-homosexual bender but there was yeah countless lectures that we heard that were like this and um and we had to yeah listen to those lectures numerous times over and over and write essays on them numerous times i remember several times getting in trouble because my essays started to get shorter and shorter at a certain point because i just had nothing more to there was just nothing more to write honestly <laughs> about you know the topic and um and yeah so a lot of the boys developed very heavy you know anti homosexual kind of energy and so it wasn't uncommon for the boys to be, you know, beating up on each other or calling each other, you know, names like, you know, faggot or something like that, you know, and, um, and, uh, and yeah, of course, naturally in an all boys school of 40 students, it's kind of like do the math and, you know, from a biological standpoint, there's got to be at least one person that's going to eventually, uh, show to be homosexual. And yes, there was definitely that in the school, you know, I'm not, I can't say, you know, necessarily who was, but if somebody is touching me at night, oh. I can probably safely say that, you know, maybe this person was experimenting sexually or, you know, maybe they're homosexual, I don't know.